All right, everybody, let's uh, go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, tonight, we're going to look at a new sutra. Uh, tonight, we are still going to be in the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. And we're going to be looking at sutta number 28 this evening. This is the Maha Hatipada Opama Sutta, the larger sutra on the simile of the elephant's footprint. <laughs> there are two suttas that are the simile of the elephant's footprint. Um, the, the Chula version, the small version, and then the Maha version, the long version. Um, so we're going to look at this. Um, I'll, I'll explain why in a moment, but I'm not going to do like a real formal reading or recitation of the sutra. We will probably more or less wind up reading most of it, but I'm not going to do it as one long reading. Um, and again, I'm going to explain why in a moment, because this is kind of a, a special sutra in that way. So... Really quickly, again, this is going to be sutta number 28, and number 27 is the smaller uh, footprint of the elephant simile. As far as I can tell, these two suttas don't have anything really to do with each other, except that they both use the simile of an elephant's footprint. But the way that they're using that simile seems to be unrelated. So I just want to say that from the beginning, we're, I'm not talking about the number 27, the other footprint of the elephant sutta. It's an interesting sutta for sure. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff in there that I just didn't want to get into. It was just sort of too complicated. And ultimately, I didn't feel like it was worth it. But tonight's sutra, I think tonight's sutra you're going to find very interesting. It, there's kind of a surprise in this sutta. So, so stay tuned for that. Um, well, let's actually, let's just go ahead and dive in. So the first reason that I don't feel like super inclined to recite this whole sutta, this is one of those suttas where it's not the Buddha talking. This is a sutta where it's Shariputra teaching the other monks, teaching the other bhikkhus. And not that I don't have the highest regard and highest respect for Shariputra, but there's a way in which sutras where other people are teaching. I've mentioned this before in Dharmador's past, but it's, a, it's complicated when we have suttas or sutras where it's not the Buddha, maybe it's Shariputra or Mahamadguyayana or somebody. And what I mean by that, is, what I mean by it's tricky with these other kinds of suttas, we, we hear things out of the mouth of Shariputra. We hear things out of the mouth of these other people that we don't really hear from the Buddha. And it's kind of questionable whether what they're teaching has been preserved because it's so wise or because it's not so wise. And so I say that because I think that any sutta or any sutra where it's not the Buddha talking, it should be read or listened to kind of very carefully in that way. Now, this sutta happens to be a pretty famous sutta or famous teaching of Shariputra. So it, it starts pretty like we, we're, we're dropped right into the action. Shariputra steps up. We're, we're in Anatha Pindika's park. We're in the Jetavana, normal place for a sutra to happen. But Shariputra steps up and says, friends. And, and they all reply, friend. And Shariputra starts this way. He says, friends, just as the footprint of any living being that walks 
can be placed within an elephant's footprint. And so the elephant's footprint is declared the chief of them because of its great size. So too, all wholesome states can be included in the Four Noble Truths. In what Four Noble Truths, you may ask? In the Noble Truth of Suffering, in the Noble Truth of the Accumulation of Suffering, in the Noble Truth of the Cessation of Suffering, and in the Noble Truth of the Way Leading to the Cessation of Suffering. A quick word about Shariputra and sort of what's about to happen in this sutta. So Shariputra basically says that the teaching of the Four Noble Truths is the premier teaching of the, of the Buddha. It's the premier teaching of the Dharma. He basically says, yeah, it's a lot like the, the footprint of an elephant. All other footprints of all other walking creatures could fit inside the footprint of an elephant. So that's our, our opama. That's our simile. That's our analogy. But here's what I want to tell you going into this. So who is Shariputra, right? If you've been coming to Dharma doors, if you've been studying suttas or sutras, you know who Shariputra is. But if you haven't been studying suttas, let me remind you, Shariputra is considered sort of like the kind of the smartest of the Buddha's disciples. He's sort of considered the most, certainly the most kind of academically smart. He kind of is, well, let me give you the backstory. I'm sure that you're aware, or I hope that you're aware, that the teachings of the Buddha, right, all the teachings are divided into these three categories, right? The suttas or the sutras that we study on Sunday nights, the vinaya or vinaya, which are all the monastic rules, right? We're not monastic, so we don't study those here. And then there's what's called the Abhidharma, the sort of the higher dharma, the meta dharma. And the Abhidharma is this sort of like really technical technical analysis of the teachings that are in the sutras. So you take the Dharma, you take the teachings that the Buddha taught, and you put it into lists, and you put it into ways in which the different teachings fit together. And that's what becomes the Abhidharma tradition. And within the Buddhist tradition, there's one monk who kind of embodies and represents the sutras, and that's Ananda. Ananda is the Buddha's young cousin who supposedly remembered everything the Buddha said, and that's why every sutra begins, thus have I heard. That's Ananda telling us the story of the sutra. There's another monk named Upali, who basically remembered all the rules. He remembered every single rule that the Buddha ever gave to all the monastics. And so Upali is the monk that kind of represents the Vinaya or the Vinaya. Well, regarding the Abhidharma, the really kind of academic, technical form of the Dharma, Shariputra, represents the Abhidharma. There's a story about this, by the way, really quickly. The story is, if you may know that during the, th the three-month rainy season, the Buddha and his followers would often kind of congregate together in a vihara and basically retreat. This was like the, the winter retreat in a way. Well, during one of the winter retreats, the Buddha kept disappearing, like disappearing. And one night, Shariputra wanted to know where the Buddha was going. And so he saw the Buddha ascend 
a staircase, a, a moving staircase of light, an escalator of light, and the Buddha would go up to a heavenly realm. And then Shariputra would see the Buddha come down from this heavenly realm. And so one rainy retreat evening, Shariputra stopped the Buddha when he was coming down from the magic escalator and was like, where, where were you? And the Buddha said, oh, I've been up in the heavenly realms where my deceased mother is, Maya, the, the Buddha's mother who gave, who died shortly after the Buddha was born. And the Buddha says, yeah, I was giving my mother up in the heavenly realm. I was giving her special teachings on the Dharma. And Shariputra was like, what special teachings? And so the Buddha re relayed, oh, well, I taught, I told her oh, this, I told her that. And that became the basis of the Abhidharma tradition. Now, that's kind of a, a mythology there, of course, right? This escalator of light, going up to a heavenly realm and all of that. But let me kind of break down the mythology. So what's really interesting about Shariputra and his particular type of knowledge, and we're going to see this tonight. So Shariputra's knowledge or the, the type of knowledge that Shariputra was kind of uh, good at <clears throat> there's a kind of a technical term in the world of buddhism <clears throat> excuse me and the technical word it's a very buddhist word by the way the word is matrika m-a-t-r-i-k-a -A, matrika and actually matrika is where we get the english word matrix from so matrix the mathematical term well and now it's become of course a um, english word the matrix and all of that but that word matrix comes from sanskrit slash poly and it seems to be a buddhist word and i mean like a word that the buddhists coined and a matrika a matrika is basically a list in other words, you might have noticed that the Buddha always teaches in these lists. Well, those kind of lists are known as matrika. But there's a very, very interesting etymology to the word matrika. And that's that the root of the word matrika is matr which in Latin, of course, is mother. And the matrikas, a, a kind of technical way to translate the word matrika or matrikas, plural, are the mothers. And so these Buddhist lists become known as mothers. Mothers of what, you may ask? <laughs> Mothers of Buddhas. That's right. Buddhas come out of these lists. <laughs> and so tonight we're going to kind of see that a little bit. So I'm going to do something because I'm not going to read the whole sutra. Let me just kind of paraphrase it and then we'll look at it piece by piece. What basically what Shariput Shariputra does in this is he says that just like the footprint of an elephant includes or could contain all the other footprints, Shariputra is about to say that the Four Noble Truths contain all the other Dharma teachings of the Buddha, all the other lists. And that's why the Four Noble Truths is the number one teaching. And I say it that way, conspicuously, this idea that the Four Noble Truths is the, the best, meaning the number one teaching. And 
Indeed, it is the number one teaching because it's the very first thing the Buddha ever taught. If you know your sutras, if you know your Buddhist history, you know that after the Buddha became awakened to the five, you know, renunciants in the Deer Park, the first thing the Buddha taught was the Four Noble Truths. So it is literally the first teaching, the, the number one teaching, but Shariputra's being kind of funny here by saying that it's like the number one teaching, meaning the first one and the best one. Now, the way this sutra goes is he says, yeah, the four noble truths, which are suffering, right? Dukkha, the accumulation of suffering, samudaya, the cessation of suffering, nirodha, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering, the marga or maga. So he says, yeah, those are the four noble truths. But the very first of the four noble truths, meaning the number one truth, <laughs> is the truth of dukkha, suffering. But he specifies, and but the Buddha specifies in his teaching. Suffering, what is suffering? Well, birth is suffering, aging is suffering, death is suffering, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are suffering. Not to get what, what one wants is suffering, and to be separated from what one wants is suffering. In short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are dukkha, are suffering. So Shariputra just said, yeah, the reason why the Four Noble Truths are the best teaching, the number one teaching, is because even just in the first of the Noble Truths, you can find the teaching of the five skandhas, which are the five aggregates affected by clinging. But then what he's going to do is going to say, oh, right. And then the number one aggregate, which is form, well, that form is earth, water, fire, and air, the four elements. And if we take the number one element, earth, <laughs> We can look into that and we can actually discover the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mental faculty or the brain, which are the six senses corresponding to the six sense objects. And those are all made of material form, which is the first aggregate. And the first and the aggregates are the cause of suffering, which is the first of the noble truths. So what you're getting here in this sutra is a kind of, you know, um, a nesting of teachings, right? The, the image, the classic image of the Russian dolls comes to mind, right? Where in this one teaching, we find there's another teaching, but in that teaching, we find there's yet another teaching <laughs> And within that, we find yet another teaching. And ultimately, Shariputra is saying, it's all in the Four Noble Truths. And if you really want to get fancy, it's all in the First Noble Truth. All right, so that's the, the gist of this sutra. The gist of this sutra is this sort of um, incredible Dharma talk on the way that you can find all the Dharma in just this one teaching of the Four Noble Truths. So, so let's explore it. So the first thing I wanna mention, because I've already mentioned it twice secretly, or I just didn't say anything about it. You'll notice, and you may already know, normally the Four Noble Truths like here, are described as the truth of suffering, the truth of the origin of suffering. That's sort of 
often how it's phrased. And even more, it's often the second noble truth is phrased the cause of suffering. Then there's the cessation of suffering and the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. I just want to draw your attention really quickly, though, that the second noble truth is about samudaya. And samudaya does not mean origin or cause. It means accumulation, accrual, like a buildup. So the second noble truth is actually about the building up of suffering. So there's this first noble truth about suffering and birth is suffering, death is suffering, not getting what you want is suffering, being separated from what you love. All of these things are suffering. The second noble truth is about the building up of that suffering, that it just keeps kind of increasing and increasing. The third noble truth is about the decreasing and decreasing until the total cessation or nirodha of that suffering. So the way the second and third noble truths work together is about what causes what causes suffering to accumulate versus what can bring it to cessation. So just a real quick word about the four noble truths on that. But then again, Shariputra doesn't waste a lot of time talking about the Four Noble Truths because he goes right to the First Noble Truth, which is about the five aggregates affected by clinging, and then immediately brings his attention to the first of those, which is Rupa, right? So Rupa, Vedana, Samya, Samskara, Vijnana. Those are our five skandhas. And remember, whenever they're talking about the five skandhas, they're talking about the sentient subject, <laughs> meaning, you know, the idea of a self. But if there's no self, you get the aggregates in that way. And those aggregates are prone to clinging. It's they're habituated and conditioned to do it in that way. So starting with the first of those aggregates, material form, what is material form? Well, and, and what is the material form aggregate affected by clinging? Great question. It's the four great elements and the material form derived from the four great elements. And what are the four great elements, of course? Earth, water, fire, and air. And then Shariputra then moves to a long meditation on the earth element. What, friends, is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal, by which they mean you, or external, meaning rocks and the ground and everything out there that's earth. And what is the internal earth element? Well, whatever internally belonging to oneself, whatever is solid, solidified, and clung to, that is, head hair, <clears throat> body hair, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself, whatever is solid, solidified, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. And that, meaning the internal earth element, that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. It should be seen this way, 
So you're looking at this, the nails, anything solid of the body. One looks at it and says, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element. All right, so that's sort of the beginning of the basic meditation regarding the earth element. Pretty standard, pretty classic in terms of Buddhism, in terms of meditating on the solid aspects of the body, the bones, the nails, anything solid. The meditation is on that solid stuff, but then the contemplation is the contemplation that we talked about last week. I think we even talked about the week before that. We've been talking about it for a while. The contemplation is about how Upon examining the solid elements of the body, the meditation is, I am not that. Right? Just want to get all my language right. So, looking at a nail, looking at a bone, the thought is, this isn't mine. And by which we're referring to ownership or possession. A noble disciple doesn't think they own their bones or owns their nails. So the meditation is that this isn't mine. The meditation is also that this isn't me. The na This nail, this fingernail, which is earth element hard, it's not me. It's not myself. And then this further extension of that. And when one sees it like that with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element. So that's sort of step one of this meditation on the solid aspects of the body. Step two is meditating on the impermanent nature of the earth element and not necessarily this earth element or this earth element, but the earth element in general, meditating on the impermanence of the earth element. So in paragraph seven here, the meditator thinks, now there comes a time when the water element is disturbed and then the external earth element vanishes. When even this external earth element, as great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, subject to disappearance, subject to change. What of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts but a little while? There can be no considering that as I, or mine, or I am. So the meditation on the impermanence of the earth element, one, when it says here, now there comes a time when the water element is disturbed and then the earth element vanishes, You'll, you'll notice Bhikkhu Bodhi and Niku, Bhikkhu Nyanamoli, they have a footnote about that. There's a few different ways to read that. Based upon the water element, fire element, and air element that we're going to look at in a second, my feeling about that line is that it's about meditating, like you could go to the beach and see this, a giant boulder, pure earth element being splashed with the water. And eventually, even that giant boulder disappears, comes to impermanence, comes to not be there. And that's a giant boulder that could be there for, you know, thousands of years. This is a, this, this earth element is fleeting and such temporary fleetingness 
is no place to settle I, mine or me on. At least that's how I understand Shari Putra's message there. Okay, everybody doing okay with this? Now we're actually about to get to what I consider to be the heart of the teaching that Shariputra is here to share with us in this sutra. So now having meditated on the earth element in this way, and in particular, I wanna remind you, by becoming disenchanted with the earth element of the body, the mind becomes dispassionate towards it. So now in verse eight or paragraph eight, with this in mind, this, this disenchantment towards the earth element. So then, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass a bhikkhu who has seen the earth element as it actually is, they, meaning the bhikkhu who understands the earth element as it actually is, they understand thus. This painful feeling born of ear contact has arisen in me. I mean, these insults, these insults have hit my ear. This painful feeling born of ear contact has arisen in me. That is dependent. It's not independent. Dependent upon what? Dependent upon contact with those sounds. Then the bhikkhu sees that contact is impermanent and that the feeling, the sensation is impermanent. They see that the perception is impermanent. They see that conditioning or habits are impermanent and they see that consciousness is impermanent. And the mind, having made an element its objective support, enters into that new objective support and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. Okay. So I want to talk about this one in depth so that we can prepare ourselves for the next one. But it's this idea, again, of this developed disenchantment and dispassion with form. And now this is where the, the sutra dis, does something a little tricky. And you kind of have to be a, a good Dharma student to notice what Shariputra does here. So when it comes to the idea of form, rupa, yes, we are talking about earth, water, fire, and air and configurations of those. So we are talking about materiality in a way. But what we kind of need to understand is that the ear and the eardrum and the hammer and the anvil and all the little bones in there. So like all of the ear faculty is rupa is form it is a certain amount of earth solidity water liquidity temperature and movement also a sound we would in the modern world we would think of it as a sound wave but you might know that you could also call a sound wave a wave formation it's a technical way of describing waves, but they describe wave formations. And so right there, we have it that a, a sound is also form. It's also rupa, but it's external rupa. The ear is, quote, internal rupa, to use the language of the sutra. So now what we're, the meditation is, it's about a sound coming at you. And the sound is like, you're a jerk. <laughs> you're stupid. 
And the idea here is, is that that sound has now landed and made contact with the ear faculty. And that, of course, is what he says by this idea that the person hearing, of, like, you're a jerk, you're stupid. The person hearing that, meditating on it, thinks this painful feeling. By pain, it's like you're feeling like, you know, a, made fun of in that way. But the meditator thinks this painful feeling born of ear contact has arisen in me. It's dependent. It's not independent. What's it dependent on? Ah, it's dependent on contact. And then the meditator sees that contact is impermanent. Oh, you mean they're not constantly sitting there calling me stupid all of the time? You mean it was just one comment? You're stupid. And there was contact in that moment, contact with the ear. And then what do we get after contact? Feeling, a sensation. But I want to remind you that the, the, the sensation, the sensation is about the sound. You're stupid. Like the sound hitting your ear and then it translates that to a brain and the brain takes that sound wave formation you're stupid and turns it into the perception so now we're up to our third aggregate the perception that person called me stupid whoa 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 slow down some sound came and hit your eardrum. A brain perceived that as being a comment about me and my intelligence. But the only way that I could fabricate such ideas, meaning the only way that I could fabricate such ideas about them calling me inferior or stupid or all of these ideas the only way that i could have fabricated all that is if i had been prior priorly conditioned to interpret all of those words and ideas in those ways because what if you know what if <laughs> what if your parents were not very nice and they taught you your whole life that the word stupid was a compliment. So what I mean is, is you were conditioned through childhood, through education by your weird parents. You were conditioned to hear the sound stupid as a compliment. Notice what happens now when the sound wave formation, you're stupid, hits the ear, there's a sensation, and then a perception, but the perception is based on my conditioning, which says they paid me a compliment. But no, you were probably conditioned to take being called stupid as an insult. So your conditioning is what informed the perception of the, the insult, and now you are there having a conscious experience. So now we're up to the fifth aggregate. A conscious experience of having been insulted. But what Shariputra is trying to point at us is that that moment of the sound wave, you're stupid. The, the moment lasted less than a second meaning the period of contact that you had with the sound, it's gone, it's already done. Again, provided the person's, person isn't sitting there going, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, like over and over and over, which of course then you are in contact with that. 
but I'm referring to a simple example of somebody walking by you and making a sound. The sound sounds something like you're stupid. And then they keep moving on. They're gone. The sound is gone, but you're sitting there having all these ideas about having been insulted. Shariputra is talking about not doing that and being aware that the contact is done. But now, and this is not in the sutta exactly, but what you are in contact with, you are no longer in contact with the sound, but you are now, if you are having these thoughts of like, I'm not stupid. How could they call me stupid? I'm smart. I'm actually really intelligent. If you're ruminating in that way, your mind, the mental faculty, is in contact with a bunch of ideas about your ego and about your this and this and that. But be clear that you're in contact with a bunch of <laughs> an internal dialogue. You're not in contact with the sound anymore. In a way, at that point, you're choosing to continue to hear it in that sense. So Shariputra would like us to be very clear about what's going on in that way. Regarding contact, sensations, perceptions, conditioning, and consciousness. And so when the person walks by and says something nasty and then keeps walking, I know it's easy for us to be like, that person, they're, they've, and without realizing that we're kind of doing it to ourselves. And I want you to kind of refer back to my example of what if your parents had taught you that stupid was an, a compliment? My, my point in, with that one, by the way, is recognizing that the person could have negative intentions, but if you hear the word stupid as, an, as a compliment, you two are having two different realities. The, the, the reality they're having where they, aha, I insulted them. I, I don't know why they would be proud of that, but whatever, right? But the idea is like they're walking away thinking, I insulted them, but you're sitting there thinking, gee, thanks. And it, this is not about delusion. It's about recognizing who's doing what to whom in that way. Okay, again, this is the big teaching of the sutra, this sort of, in a way, dealing with anger in that sense. So everybody doing okay with this? Awesome. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, that was super clear. But Yay. I I don't that last sentence is kind of like, what? <laughs> and his mind having made an element, ah. it's yeah. a support. I get I kind of get that. Okay, he's made instead of fixating on someone calling him stupid, uh, they fixated instead of someone calling them stupid they fixated on it's a sound wave it you know that part i get but enters into that new objective support and acquires confidence i don't know is that just what you explained is that a, a short way of saying it? it is kind of sort of yeah you'll notice that there's a footnote number 334 here that footnote is a complicated footnote and it's actually about how that sentence is tricky Okay, And it's like, it could be interpreted this way. It can be interpreted that way. My feeling about it, and this sides with one interpretation of that, when it talks about this idea of having, having made an element, it's objective support. And by it, that's what the, the question is. I read it the way I think Bhikkhu Bodhi reads it, which is that it's about chitta, the mind. So, and the mind, having made an element, in this case, the earth element, 
its objective support enters into that new objective support and then acquires confidence and so on. My understanding of that new objective support is let's say it was my fingernail, just, just, just for simplicity's sake. Before I have started this meditation, this is me. I would be meditating on my fingernail, a part of my body. But by going through this process of seeing, no, no, that's the earth element. This is the taking the element as, as the objective support of my mind. And now I have a new objective support, which is not me and my fingernail. It's this solid thing. And now with this dispassionate, disenchanted view of not my fingernail, but just a piece of solid matter, I can be very equanimous, even keeled in that sense about it. Cool. Okay. Now, this was actually, this long conversation we had now is preparatory, and it's preparatory for the next verse. So the Buddha takes this up a notch, and now we're not going to just talk about being called bad names. No, now it's if others attack that bhikkhu in ways that are unwished for, undesired and disagreeable by contact with fists, clods, sticks, or knives. The meditator understands thus. The body, this body, is of such a nature that contact with fists, clods, sticks, and knives assail it. But this has been said by the Buddha. This is what the Blessed One said, though, in the Sutra on the simile of the Saul, which we did not read. But in that Sutra, the Buddha says, Bhikkhus, even if bandits were to sever you savagely limb by limb with a two-handed saw, he who gives rise to a mind of hatred towards them would not be carrying out my teachings. And then with that in mind, with the Buddha's teaching and with that in mind, tireless energy shall be aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness established. My body shall be tranquil and untroubled, my mind concentrated and unified. And now let contact with fist clawed sticks and knives assail this body, for this teaching of the Buddha is being practiced by me. So a very I want to mention something very important about this, because I know that this is a really tricky teaching, this one. I want to make it really clear that nowhere in here and nowhere in the Buddhist tradition are they suggesting or advising any kind of abuse, like taking abuse. This is not about taking abuse. And obviously, in all circumstances, we would want to be wise and avoid abuse. What the Buddha is talking about, though, is the situation in which it happens. And what we want to notice from a point of view of practice, it's deep, it's heavy, but it it's really something to meditate on. What it is, is it's about this very simple kind of um, equation, if you will. And what it is, is if somebody, if I happen to be in a situation, and actually... Actually, I'll share a personal, very personal story so that this is not abstract. This is not hypothetical. I've shared this story before, or I, I have a few of these stories, actually. So I used to live in New York a long time ago, went to school there, went to, um, anyways, went to college there and lived there for a long time. And I had numerous circumstances in New York of being struck, being struck randomly multiple times one time i was on the subway and i was teaching 
Buddhism classes up at Hunter College. And I was taking the subway up to teach my class. And I had my little, my little sutra book. And my and I was in the subway, like getting ready for my teach my class. And a group of rowdy kids were sort of down at one end of the train. And then we pulled into some station in Brooklyn. And they got out. And as they were walking by the train cars, right as the train cars were closing, one of the kids reached in and bip, clocked me like hard, knocked my glasses off, knocked my sutra book onto the ground. And of course, I was angry. <laughs> it was a very immediate, natural reaction to get angry. But the thing was, is that I was in this interesting situation where the the train was leaving the station. And so I was just there with the anger. And that's when I really kind of had a direct experience of this teaching, which is I'm sitting here now angry at that kid. But what I realized, and it's, it's hard to explain because it's just one of those things that I realized. What I realized in that moment I was basically like, wow, how angry must he be? If he's ready to knock some random person out on the street, he must have a lot of anger inside. Well, what? it's not even about what use or what value. I was asking myself not what use or what value does this anger have? I basically realized, oh, he gave me his anger. He was like, hey, here you go. I got a lot of it. I've got so much of it. You want some? And I took it and I realized that I was either going to hand it right back to him, given the opportunity, or I was going to carry it with me and on the next opportunity, kind of transfer it. And what I realized, I was like, oh, I could just squash this right now. I could just like be done with the anger. And I did, and it was so liberating. And cause I realized, oh, he's gone. The kid's gone. He'll never know how angry I am or how not angry I am. So at this point, it's just me being angry or not. And that's when I was like, I don't want to be angry. I want to be joyful and go teach my Dharma class. And so that's where I was like, oh. And that was sort of my direct experience of having not anger towards somebody who, who put the fist on in that way. So, and again, I wasn't... Um, uh, hoping that that would happen. I wasn't looking for an opportunity to practice patience, but an opportunity presented itself to practice patience. And there's a way that, a, in a, a, certainly in a Mahayana Buddhist context, a bodhisattva would very much look at that as an opportunity for practice. And not only that, if we want to get into it, the bodhisattva practice so not the arahat bhikshu practice of not getting angry. If you want to really do it, the bodhisattva level is to have compassion for the kid who hit me, which I did in a way, because I was like, oh, he must be very angry. That's unfortunate for him, really. And I really did have that feeling of, of compassion for him. And it, it, it was healing for me and probably for whoever else I ran into the rest of that night in that way. So, all right. So I just wanted to kind of deal with that because I didn't want to make it sound like Buddhism was some weird form of stoicism where we're out there just, you know, looking for abuse or trying to be doormats. Or, it's not like that, but it's about when unfortunate situations happen. How do we deal with it? Everybody okay with that? Awesome. So let's keep going so I can get to the surprise. So 
Well, oops, sorry, lost my page real quick. Well, for time's sake, I'm going to skip the rest of the earth element one. And I'm going to quickly do the water, fire, and air. So after the long section on the earth element, which pretty much sets the, the format or the structure for the rest of these, Shariputra says, and what friends is the water element? Well, the water element might be external like oceans and seas and tap water <laughs> or it could be internal and what is the internal water element whatever internally belonging to oneself is water or watery and which is clung to that is bile phlegm pus blood sweat fat tears grease spittle snot oil of the joints urine, and whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water or watery, and which is clung to. This is what's called the internal water element. Now, both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom, which is to say, regarding all the watery elements of the body, that's not mine. These I am not. These are not the self. When one sees it thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with water and makes the mind dispassionate towards the water element. Now, same thing here, but I just want to point out something. That line about now, both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element. This is another aspect of this kind of equanimous teaching. And it's about like, you know, this is just lemon water. So it's water. And I don't think that this cup of lemon water is me. Like, I don't think this water is me. So here we go. Is it me now? Well, it's kind of going down my throat. When when does it become me? Right? <laughs> well, the idea is, is that you could, I guess, get, you know, nerdy and scientific and trying to, when does it actually become part of me? But that wouldn't be the great philosophical question, of course, of, what is me? And what would it mean to be part of me? And that's where the, the, the meditator here is meditating on how, oh, right, all this watery stuff, quote unquote, in here, it's no different than the watery stuff that's out there. Neither of them are you. But notice the mind does have a kind of clingy clinginess towards the internal watery element, right? My tears, my saliva, I am those things. One, one can think in that way. Now, the, the analogy is same in terms of like the water element. You think of like a giant ocean, it's huge, right? But then as soon as you start to get close to the shore, it starts to get really shallow until pretty soon the entire ocean is actually just a little trickle of water. And then at the very edge of the ocean, it disappears. And so this idea that the water element, even the ocean, even a sea is impermanent, how much more so the water elements of the body, those can't be mine, me, or self. And so that's the meditation on the water element. Same thing goes for the fire element and fieriness. And what is internal fire, you may ask? Well, it's whatever is fiery or 
fire internally that is clung to, such as warmth, um, what is consumed, the warmth sense in your stomach, what is eaten, what is drunk, consumed. We're talking about metabolism. Is the fire element at work in the body? Same meditation goes for the fire element, though, that it is impermanent and not a not self. The air element is about movement. It's about breathing in, breathing out. It's about farting, frankly. It's about those kinds of wind movements in the body. And the same thing goes for the air or wind element. I apologize for moving through those so quickly. Again, the formula we went through with the earth element is the formula for all of these. But now I want to jump over so that we can get to the fun surprise. I want to jump over to verse 26 if you have the Wisdom Publication Edition. Oh, and by the way, also, of course, the teaching regarding the water, fire, and air element, it all comes back to that same teaching about not getting upset if, you're in, if, if your wind element is insulted or so and so on. So after Shariputra finishes the four elements, he says this in verse 26. Friends, just as when a space is enclosed by timber and creepers, grass, and clay, it comes to be called a house. So too, when a space is enclosed by bones and sinews, flesh and skin, it comes to be termed rupa, material form. Now that little line, that little line right there about space. Now it's a really easy one to miss because it doesn't have, at least in the wisdom publication edition, it doesn't have its own header where it says like the space element, but let's meditate on that for a moment. And what I mean is, I, I was actually meditating on this earlier today, get, kind of getting ready for tonight. So it's this idea of like, you know, in Buddhism, they talk a lot about abodes, a lot about abiding. And so like, you know, where do you abide? Well, right now I'm abiding in my house, right? And you might be abiding in your house, right? But you also might go to a, a monastery or a Zen center or something to do meditation. And then you would be abiding in a dojo or abiding in a temple hall, right? You might also go out to an open field and you would be abiding in an open field or abiding in a forest, right? Well, think about this for a moment. Let's say you were abiding in an open field and somebody erected just one wall to your north side. I suppose you would still be abiding outside in an open field, just next to a wall. <laughs> well, what if somebody built a wall on the south side of you? Well, I suppose you're still just meditating and abiding out in an open field, but now you just have a wall on your north and south side, right? Well, what if somebody built a wall on the east and west side? And then just for fun, they put a little tent roof on top of it. Are you still abiding in an open field? Well, from a certain perspective, you are. There happens to be a wall to your north, south, east, and west, and a little tent-like roof on top of you, but aren't you still in the middle of the field? Oh, you're in a house now. Huh. Are you? Space is a very interesting dimension of reality is what I'm getting at. 
And so there's this idea of, well, what I just mentioned, but then in the same way, when space, when a space is enclosed by bones, flesh, and skin, it comes to be termed rupa, the form element. Think about that one, though. That sort of, that vast spacious expansiveness that is kind of always there. You are always in that giant open field meditating, but there might be obscuring walls around you that are then creating the mental state of being in a house. And then you are indeed abiding in a house if that is your mental state. But if what I'm getting at is abiding is about the mind. It is not about the physical location. And that's a very kind of important point about this term abiding in the world of Buddhism, that it's a, a aspect of the mind in that way. Now, Shariputra uses that to open up this new section where he's going to start talking about the I. And he's going to create a new formula. And I'm just going to give you the beginning of it. In verse 27, he says, all right, friends, if internally, meaning belonging to self in that way, if internally the I is intact and like functional, but no external forms come into its range. And there is no corresponding conscious engagement. Then there is no manifestation of the corresponding section of consciousness. And he basically goes on to say, but if the eyes working right, and it does come into contact with a visual form, there will emerge or there will arise in that section, meaning the visual field, there will arise consciousness. So pretty standard Buddhist psychology in that way. But then I'm going to have to just jump to it, but it's towards the, the bottom of page 283, towards the bottom of it, verse 28. He says, the consciousness that's arising, which again is the fifth aggregate too, he says the consciousness in, in what has thus come to be is included in the consciousness aggregate, fine, which is affected by clinging because it's an aggregate. And one understands this regarding visual consciousness. This indeed is how there comes to be the inclusion, gathering, and amassing of things into these five aggregates affected by clinging. But this has been said by the Buddha, by the Blessed One, one who sees dependent origination sees the Dharma. And one who sees the Dharma sees dependent origination. And these five aggregates affected by clinging are dependently arisen. The desire, indulgence, inclination, and holding based on these five aggregates affected by clinging, that's the origin of suffering. The removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust for these five aggregates affected by clinging, that's nirodha. That's the cessation of suffering. If you come to that state of mind, well, then at that point, bhikkhus, much has been done. Much has been accomplished if you can have that realization. So... I'm often teaching that dependent origination is the Dharma and the Dharma is dependent origination. Like I'm a big believer in that. Like I'm a teacher of that. I get it from the Buddha. Now, 
there's a lot of different ways to understand that idea of dependent origination. In the context of this sutra, my feeling about it is that Shariputra is referring to the emergent state of conscious awareness that is a temporary emergent phenomena, truly an emergent phenomena like a magnetic field that is dependent upon, which is why he's talking about dependent origination, a conscious state of awareness is an emergent property dependent upon contact between sense organ and sense object. No contact, no conscious awareness. In early Buddhism, the kind of Buddhism represented by this sutra and the kind of Buddhism represented by Shariputra, there are eyeballs floating around the world, enlodged in heads. And there are visual things to be seen in the world. And there are sounds in the world to be heard by ears. And there are smells or scents to be sensed or smelt by the nose and so on. There are those, but consciousness is only there when it's happening. It's emergent. <laughs> Now, that's the early Buddhist idea regarding mind states, that they are these emergent presences. Like, presently, this is an emergent mind state that is then conscious of being in such a mind state. But it's dependent upon everything you're seeing right now, everything you're hearing right now, everything you're smelling, everything you're tasting, the temperature in the room, your butt against the bottom of your cushion, Every sensation you're having right now that you're in contact with is giving rise to the state of mind you're in right now. And with every little change of sensation, that state of mind keeps morphing and changing and is never the same state of consciousness at any given moment. That's the basic early Buddhist teaching regarding states of mind, not getting confused about a me that was there last week, that will, will be there in 10 weeks. There's only this. But that's the early Buddhist teaching. The surprise, what I was looking forward to sharing with you. So Shariputra, he goes through the eyeball and then goes all the way through the idea of dependent origination, which is the Dharma. And the Dharma is dependent origination. And then he does the ear, and then he does the nose, the tongue, the body, and then he does the mental faculty, the brain, and goes all the way through to the same refrain, the same idea. Um, yeah, about if one can see dependent origination, one sees the Dharma, and so on. The surprise for tonight is... This sutra is really, really, really interesting because it is a perfect complement to the famous Heart Sutra. So if you know the Prajna Paramita Heart Sutra, the famous Heart Sutra, you will know that that, which is a Mahayana Buddha Sutra, so it's kind of an advanced form of Buddhism, but you may know that it begins, of course, with a bodhisattva, the bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara, who is contemplating this transcendent wisdom of a Buddha, is contemplating basically dependent origination and emptiness. And Avilokiteshvara bodhisattva, while practicing the profound pranya paramita, clearly realizes that the five aggregates are empty. And so in the realization of the emptiness of the five aggregates, Avilokiteshvara says, Shariputra, form is no different from emptiness. Emptiness is no different from form. Sensation, perception, conditioning, consciousness, those two are no different from emptiness. In fact, the I, 
ear, nose, tongue, body, brain? Not in emptiness. Sounds, sights, flavors, scents, tactile objects, and thoughts? Not in emptiness. Visual consciousness, auditory consciousness, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, mental awareness? Not in emptiness. In other words, the Heart Sutra follows the exact same set of teachings regarding noble truths, skandhas, aggregates, except the important thing about the Heart Sutra is that it is a bodhisattva telling Shariputra, Shariputra, all your dharmas are empty, dude. <laughs> They're all empty. Whereas in our Elephant Footprint Sutra, certain dharmas are empty, meaning the self ones, the selfing ones are empty. The, the, the idea of a self is empty and delusional. The idea of me and mine is empty and delusional. Earth, water, fire, air? Yeah, those are real. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, a brain thing? Yeah, those are real. But the meanness of it all and this fleeting emergent consciousness? Yeah, th that's all ephemeral and empty. But then the... And by the way, you probably, most of you already know this, but if you don't, the big division between what is called the Hinayana, the early form of Buddhism, and then the Mahayana, the sort of more developed form of Buddhism, the division is that in the Hinayana, the self is empty, but the five aggregates are very real. In the Mahayana tradition, the realization is that the aggregates are empty too, not just the self. Really quickly, if you haven't heard this from me, if you don't know this kind of teaching, I use, I use this one a lot, meaning the clock. So the idea here is, is that I think, you might think too, that I have one thing in my hand, just one thing. And that one thing is a clock. But if you look really carefully, you begin to notice that this is much more than just one thing. This has got a it's got a battery in here somewhere. It's got moving parts. It's got this plastic piece. It's got this plastic. It's a bunch of parts. This is the famous uh, chariot analogy too in Buddhism where the idea of a car or the chariot, the label, the singular word, the singular idea of a car or a chariot or a clock. Well, there's the single idea, and that is like me, self, one, just one. No, 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 there's just one thing here. There's not eyes, or there's not two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, a tongue. It's me. The idea of me is like the idea of a clock. It's a label, but is there a clock? By the way, if you think this is a clock, just for anybody out there that thinks this is a clock, I would ask you if that's a clock. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think that's a clock. And I know the whole thing about a broken clock is right twice a day. So I get that this is like, but this is not a clock. It looks like a clock. It resembles a clock, but it's not actually a clock. And you know why? Because it doesn't clock. It doesn't keep time. Well, you know what else doesn't keep time? 
my broken clock. This is broken. It hasn't worked for years. So there's actually no difference between these two things. But I know you think this one might be actually a clock. But it's not. It looks like one just like this does. And that's when we realize, oh, a clock is a concept. There's no clocks anywhere. That's an idea. If you're there, if, if you have that insight about a clock or a car or what have you, that's basically like the insight of no self. Oh, there's no actual Michael. There's eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, brain. Well, that's like realizing that there's no clock, but there's buttons, electronics, and let me see if I can get it out, and a battery, right? This is like the heart, right? But so now we've successfully done away with the clock, right? And we are left with the parts. Well, let's take a closer look at this part. Is that just one thing? Or is a battery another one of those idea things? And that this is actually the casing. There's the battery acid inside. There's the printing. I, I assume that this battery will work without the printing right? I don't need to know it's a Duracell battery, right? So now all of a sudden we've got the printing, the casing, the battery acid. It's a bunch of parts as well. Well, let's crack it open and take a look at the battery acid. Is it just one thing? Oh, battery acid is another one of those word concept ideas. Let's look further. Oh, molecules. Let's dig deeper. Oh, elements. Let's dig deeper. Oh, you know, atoms. Let's dig deeper. Oh, look, particle or uh, uh, nucle nucleons or whatever. Let's keep digging and coming up with differentiated terms. <laughs> it all unravels. The sweater of life unravels as you do this. And this is the kind of the... It's how we move from Hinayana to Mahayana. Hinayana was this incredible realization about the self or the clock. Eventually, they applied that same logic to the parts. And, they, and Shariputra gets schooled. Shariputra gets explained by the Bodhisattva. No I... No ear, no nose, no tongue. In fact, if you think about it, I, I, I do this one a lot. Is, is this my nose? Is this my nose? That's nah, my cheek, right? How about right in there? Is that my nose? Oh, that's right. My nose is the holes. My nose is the hole. This isn't my nose. I don't breathe with this part. I breathe through the holes. Where's my nose? Oh, I lost my nose. Where did my nose go? It's as if I never had one and it was always just an arbitrary distinction of flesh. It's almost as if that is the case. I digress. I wanted to share this sutra with you tonight about this lovely um, elephant print simile. I wanted to share it with you because of its correlation with the heart sutra. And by the way, it's more, there's more connection that you, than you might think. And what I mean by that is the magic, so to speak, the magic of the heart sutra if you didn't know, there is, there is a, there's not just one sutra, but there is an entire genre of sutra. There are many, many sutras 
that are all these Prajna Paramita Sutras. It's a genre of Mahayana Buddhist Sutra. They are solely focused on the wisdom teachings I just gave you regarding emptiness and the emptiness of all phenomena, the emptiness of all dharmas. That's the teaching of the Prajna Paramita Sutras. This really profound idea of the emptiness of all phenomena. Traditionally, the Prajna Paramita Sutra is a million lines of poetry. It's a huge sutra. It's gigantic. But there is a smaller version of it that is closer to 250,000 lines of verse. And there's actually a smaller version of it in 18,000 lines and a smaller version in 8,000 lines and a smaller version in 800 lines called the Vajra or the Diamond Sutra. And this process of condensing the Prajna Paramita Sutra down, it culminates in the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra is considered a, conden a condensing down, a concentration of this giant, giant text into just 250 Chinese characters in the Chinese, super small. And that type of nesting or reducing of larger amounts of information into smaller things like the Heart Sutra, that's what the elephant print simile is about that the elephant print contains all the other footprints the same way that the teaching of the Four Noble Truths contains all the other teachings of the Buddha. Shariputra represents that kind of nested Dharma teaching in that way, where you can really take any teaching of the Buddha and boo, 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 unpack the whole Dharma. That's like Shariputra's vibe. Is, is that kind of thing. So I was very happy to be able to share this sutra with you. Any last questions, comments, answers, or ideas about it? Thoughts or? Yeah, Noe. And I'm sorry, Noe, I think you did have your hand up a long time ago. I apologize. Although right? I put it down, you answered. Thank you, Noam. Uh, thank you, Michael. Wow, great. Uh, oh, just a, a comment that I was wondering when someone, I asked someone about meditation, and they said, well, you can say, this is not a body, this is not a mind. It's a, a, a form of a chant. And I really hear that in this sutra. Oh, yeah, this is not a body, this is not a mind. So I just really resonate with that, all of it, but that specific part. I just wanted to share that. Excellent. Lane? Thank you, Michael. Um. I'm stuck on something weird and I don't know what you're going to do with it. So when you were talking about everything being empty and like looking through the molecules and everything getting smaller and smaller, I was just like, wait, is that empty or is everything infinitely full? And I don't know what I mean by that. Yep. So I know that my example of going to the molecular level to the atomic level I know that that obviously sounds like it's about getting smaller, but it's not actually about getting smaller. It's more about basically it's about differentiation and then labeling. And so no matter, you know, it could be about like, it, it could be something as large as like a, whatever, um, uh, let's a star, but then with a better microscope, we realize, or a telescope, we realize, oh no, it's actually two stars. It's actually two. But what's happening is, is that from a certain vantage point, the naked eye or a certain telescope, the differentiation is, Ooh, what's that singular? What, what's that? Oh, it's a star. What should we call it? Let's call it Alpha Centauri. 
But then we get a better telescope and we're like, oh no, it's two things. We got to come up with two names. And so it's more about when we notice difference, differentiation, then we can come up with names for things. That's what I was getting at more in that way. Awesome. All right, everybody. So that'll conclude this particular Dharma Doors. Thanks again, everybody, for being here and listening. I appreciate it so much. Always happy and excited to share this great teachings with you. All right, I'll be back next Sunday with yet another sutta. Uh, also from the same collection, we're going to keep going, but I don't know which one. Find out next week. Thank you, Michael. Excellent. My great pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Hope to see you next time. Be well. Have a great week. Great evening.